This is what's wild in New Hampshire by wildlife biologist Eric Corp. Hey, look where I am. I'm looking at uh, Becky here, but look at, at this room. I'm at New Hampshire Audubon, and it is filled with birds. <laughs> that is a weird one over there. I'll have to ask some questions when we get done from Becky. <laughs> Becky, right. I am recording these for Women's History Month, trying to record women who have been instrumental over my career in changing New Hampshire, making it better, making it way better in protecting and watching over and taking care of our fish and wildlife. And I'm just trying to document this so we'll we'll have it. So here is a woman who has made history. Becky, introduce <laughs> introduce yourself and tell us some of the projects you worked on at New Hampshire Audubon and, and how long you've been here and yeah, what, what are some of the things that you see have changed over your time and hopefully for the better. Some of them, I know there's, you know, some of our birds are being impacted by things like climate change and other things, but uh, a lot of good things have happened under your tutelage and several of your other sisters here at New Hampshire Audubon. So uh, we'll talk about your, your history today. What's your history? Well, thanks, Eric. I'm Becky Suamala. I'm a biologist with New Hampshire Audubon, and I've been here for what we just figured out, 34 years, I think. Since, Since 1988, 1988. you said. 1988. Woo-hoo! Uh, long time, and a lot has changed in that time. I certainly can't take credit for, for many of the successes, but I've been around to witness them. And uh, actually, one of the things that first got me going in this career was seeing a peregrine falcon on a breeding cliff where it had not been for years and years and years. A success story bringing peregrines back. New Hampshire Audubon has been involved with that. I haven't personally, but wow, I've, it was so exciting to see that first one and then to watch the numbers just go up and up has been terrific. You know, New Hampshire Audubon, it's a small staff, maybe 10 of you, 8 of you, I don't know, not very many. So you always, all of you have a paddle in the water on every, in any project, I would say, right? It, well, we certainly have a paddle in the water with the organization doing one thing or another. And one of the things that I've worked on um, has been the citizen science end of reporting information. So in my case, it's been a lot with bird sightings. And way back when I started, people sent in little three by five paper slips with their bird reports that we'd computerize and have available. And now we've got eBird, huh. you know, where people report their sightings online. And they can take a picture probably. They can take pictures. So it's documented. Their photos, documented. Yeah, yeah, nice. And where we used to think a busy spring was 2,000 reports, now a busy spring is easily over 200,000. Get out. Really? What a wonderful sites. program. So we're learning way more about New Hampshire, where things are, when they arrive, yeah. how long they stay, yeah. where do they nest, all from observations of the public. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Burgers what, that are out there. what a great program. It, it is. And you know, you can't get that information any other way. No. Nope. You, you can't send out a thousand biologists gather there are not there are not a thousand <laughs> no, there, <laughs> there are, are not to go around uh, so those are really critical sightings critical pieces of information whether it's eBird whether it's our annual backyard winter bird survey or volunteers helping out with specific projects you know, peregrine watchers eagle watchers I mean think about the first eagle nest I just started at New Hampshire Audubon when we had the first eagle nest back in the state up at Lake Ambagog in the same tree where they last nested. I mean, it was amazing. And that last nest was what? In the 1940s or so. Right. Uh, so it just some amazing. So 40 years, 40 years later, right. a, a re-nest in the same tree. Yes. Yeah. I mean, the tree's still there for goodness sakes. It's amazing. Um, so there have been some really great things that have happened. Um, there are also some species that aren't doing well, and one of the ones is one I work on, which is the common nighthawk. Uh, it's an aerial insectivore, which means it feeds on insects when it's flying on the wing, and uh, they have disappeared from most of New Hampshire, and we don't know why. It's not just New Hampshire, I mean, it's part of a larger decline, but we've been looking at where are they still, how many are nesting, and there are less than 20 nesting pairs in the state. Uh, so it's it didn't used to be like that. People used to see them downtown areas. You'd go out in the evening, you'd hear them, peep, peep, yep. 
flying around, catching I insects, know. even around the state capitol here. Oh yeah, I and did bat work for 25 years, and where was I at night? I was on rooftops, yeah. serenaded by the night hawks. Yeah. I, every city, New Manchester, Concord, yeah. I had night hawks every night wherever I was in, in yeah. any city. Yeah, and, and Manchester used to be a hot spot, yep. and there are none there oh, now. None there now, none. wow, wow. The only two cities that have them are Keene, which has one pair, and Concord, no longer in downtown Concord, but they're still in the east side near the Pine Barrens. Okay. Uh, and they're, they're um, up in Ossipee, right. in the Pine yep. Barrens habitat up there that um, folks have worked so hard to maintain um, right. up there and keep, keep a vibrant habitat, and night, night hawks are there. So you're making history by, by mapping where the nighthawks are and trying to protect and preserve them the best way we can. Do what we can and try and figure out what, what's going on. Why are they de declining? It, it, in, what can they, we do? They, well, they're an illustration of one of the things that I've seen happen over the years in that the complexity of dealing with a bird species that's declining has just mushroomed uh, because nighthawks are an example because they winter all the way down in south america okay so you have a bird up here it's nesting up here it's migrating all across the u.s down central america down to south america it's wintering in south america hmm. the problems or the sources of potential mortality or issues with their populations thousands are of miles anywhere along yeah. wow. That. wow and it could be a combination Right. And when we were dealing with things like osprey that were suffering from, say, raccoon predation uh, at their nests, you could put a predator guard up right. and see an instant response. By the so, way, I just was at the Milford Hatchery this morning. There was, by the count of the staff, 10 ospreys there today. He said by tomorrow there'll be 12. Oh, They goodness. are circling there enjoying the oh. trout today but you know once the snow threat is gone they'll net them so when he said another five or ten days they'll be protecting their fish with nets but so yeah. far the ospreys mm, are enjoying the trout and they're only just coming back right now seasonally anyway right um, and their population has increased in this state from those predator guards that we put up simple problem relatively simple solution not true with many of the problems we have or the declines we see happening with some of the species today. And that's been a big change over 30 plus years. Yeah, and I bet you put some of those guards up. I did not. You did I not? I did not get dragged out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know a lot yeah. of the staff members here have over the years. <laughs> now, I've, I've been um, dive bombed by turns and packed out. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. Been, been out on the island. Um, I was at the Isles of Shoals as we were working on the turn reintroduction yep. project. Yep. And been out there scaring the gulls away. Sure. Know, getting out there pre-dawn, just as it's getting light, which in the summertime is 4.30 in the morning. Uh, <laughs> but on an island out in the Atlantic, off yeah, the coast, yeah. not a bad day of duty there. It, it actually was a wonderful place to be. But on that process of scaring the gulls away, um, was something that allowed the terns to come back and nest because the gulls would prey on the terns. And nobody had tried non-lethal control of gulls before to restore a tern colony. Okay. New Hampshire Audubon was the first to do that, and really it was under the direction of Diane DeLuca. Yep. Um, and she pretty much... Um, we'll talk to Diane. Yes, oh, that's yeah. Well. She made history with that, really, yep. because yep. that was the first time it was tried. Okay. And it worked. Yep. And that... That turn colony is about 3,000 pair now. Okay. So that's just, it's phenomenal yep. Yep. Uh, on that. So, so, so some great things. We have more eagles now than in recent history, let's put it, recent meaning a couple hundred years or more. Yeah. More peregrines. Mm -hmm. Today I saw lots of ospreys, so yeah. they're up. And yeah. uh, the terns out at the Owls of Show. So a lot of good things have happened while you've been on board. So you have helped make the history that we have today where many things are doing good. Not everything, you know, uh, things change and the environment changes and we know, you know, we're doing things to the environment we shouldn't be doing and it's just going to take time to fix it. 
Yeah, and that's I, I think some what some of the successes show is that if you have target app, targeted efforts with funding, you can make a, re, a real difference. Okay. Um, and figuring out what the issue is is another major piece okay. of it. Okay. Yep. And so now you know we've got field birds that are declining. Things like eastern meadowlarks, um, bobolinks, savannah sparrows, um, whippoorwills. Whippoorwills, yes, but whippoorwills do have some strongholds still. Yep, okay. And when you talk, yep. if you talk with Pam Hunt, she'll, yep. oh, she'll yeah. talk about some, oh, of the, okay. some of those. But eastern meadowlarks are almost gone from the state, and they need big grasslands. Yep. You know, the only thing left there is the airports. Exactly. Yeah, and a few large fields. Okay. But a, a mowing regime is also important to the field birds. They have okay. to have enough time yep. to raise their young before the fields are mowed. So um, working with the landowners. Yes. Something yeah. else Audubon does. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So that's been been another sort of part of the conservation story that's evolved over time. Okay. Is working more, you know, contacting the people who have eagle nests. Contacting the folks, getting information to people who have fields or are managing fields, okay. and how you can maintain grassland bird populations. Nice, nice. Um, that's changed a lot over the yeah. last thirty plus okay. years. Okay, all right, well, cool. So a lot of history has been made, and you've been a big part of that, and a lot of successes, and we are hoping for more. So awesome, awesome. Thank you, Becky. This is wildlife biologist Eric Hoare for what's wild in New Hampshire.